All right, all right. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I am incredibly excited for this conversation. If you have not heard from Andy, you're in for a real treat. Um, so Andy, thanks so much for being here thanks today. Thanks for having me, good to see you. Great to see you too. Um, so I, many of you, if you're familiar with Andy, you know he's had an incredibly, incredibly varied career. He is a two-time founder, Bonobos and Pi. Uh, he is the author of Burn Rate, which recently came out in paperback. I read it last summer in about 24 to 48 hours, right when it came out, phenomenal. And uh, you recently had a very successful TED Talk. So I actually want to start by just asking, um, can you speak about the motivation for telling your story, for really owning your identity as neurodivergent and, yes. and really taking that to a, to a much bigger audience? Yes. Can everyone hear us, by the way, or no? It's just like, not to, OK, cool. So I wrote a book about my journey with bipolar disorder type 1. Raise your hand if you're familiar with bipolar disorder. Okay, so most of you know what this is. If you didn't raise your hand, it's, it's basically a disorder of mood. It means your highs go too high and your lows go too low. And if you're building something, if you're a builder, a creator, an entrepreneur, you might feel like your job is a roller coaster already. And interestingly enough, with bipolar, we think it's one to 3% of the general population. So it's reasonably high number of people. In the entrepreneurial population, it's like 11%. So I like to joke to people now, if you have bipolar, there's a better chance you're gonna build an awesome company than if you are free of bipolar. I mean that in sort of a dark way, but I had both. I was an entrepreneur and I was dealing with this mood disorder in complete denial of it for 16 years. I was diagnosed when I was 20, senior in college. It's a very embarrassing experience to be diagnosed with bipolar because it typ typically comes from a messianic delusion. So like, I thought I was God for about a week. And by the way, if you haven't been God, it's awesome. It's like super amazing for you to feel like you like control everything, but you're a total liability to everyone else and it's a total shit show. And so I did what a lot of people do when they get diagnosed, which is just buried it. Like straight up in denial, that didn't happen. We found some other ways to explain it away. And then it was just 16 years of not being in touch with the underlying reality of how my brain worked and started a brand and bonobos and all the highs and lows was doubly high and doubly low and then kind of all boiled over in 2016. I spent a week at Bellevue Hospital in New York in the psychiatric ward. At the time, we had 500 employees. We raised over 100 million of capital. You know, it was a different time in life. And so I was ready to deal with it. I was like, okay, hello, like I have this issue. It's time to take medication. It's time to be in therapy. It's time to deal with all of it. And I walked out of Bellevue Hospital straight into handcuffs. And I was arrested and charged with misdemeanor and felony assault. And if that isn't a good hook to read the book, <laughs> I don't know what is. It's really, really good. But Andy, I think, you know, it's very interesting because We've known each other through the entrepreneur community for probably about a decade. And I think one of the things that I've always admired about you is that transparency and that just, you know, ability to talk about what is. That's not always celebrated in the business community and the founder community. There's so much bullshit. There's a lot of people kind of telling these stories about how everything's perfect and they're these overnight success. What, um, and, and luckily, I mean, you have had that massive success with the Bonobos exit that has given you um, this platform, but, but what has, what has driven your decision to, to share your story? Yeah, so raise your hand if you've written a book. Okay, okay, well, soon. So writing a book is not that hard. I know that that sounds wrong, but it's actually like, five hours a week for two years, which is not that much time, but you just gotta like do it. So I'm not saying it's easy, but it's not that hard if that makes sense. But when you're writing a book, it sort of like hangs over you. This is gonna sound like the opposite of what I just said. It hangs over you like a dark cloud. Cause you're like, I should be working on the book. I should be writing the book. So you don't have time to read other books typically when you're writing a book, but I read one and it's called Falling Upward. Anyone heard of it? So it's written, oh wow, amazing. 
Do you want to paraphrase or should I? Okay, so Falling Upward is written by a Franciscan friar in New Mexico, a guy named Richard Rohr. And he talks about how for the first 40 years of our lives, we are constructing a mask. And the mask is basically how the world wants to see us. And we construct that mask because it's how we stand out from the crowd. It's how we differentiate. It's maybe how we find a mate. It's how we build a career. It's the person that we are with our family and our friends and even ourselves. It's like the mask. And if we're fortunate in life, we get to, in our second 40 years, so from like 40 to 80, take the mask off, right? And we get to say like, here's the real me behind this person that I had to be to try to become a person. And that for me was like the book. Like there was a day in 2020, there was a, a profile in Architectural Digest that came out about the home that my wife Manuela and I keep. And it's like impeccable. My wife is Brazilian, she's got great taste, Brazilian mid-century modern, shit that neither of us grew up with. You know what I mean? Like we grew up in the Midwest where it was like, I begged for like a Gap flannel. I remember it was $42 for a Gap flannel and my mind was blown that like my, high school, my, my classmates could afford it. And now we have like, I don't know, a, a credenza from Sao Paulo or some obnoxious shit that we got on first dibs. This is not who we are. And so like the likes are racking up and there's like the wonderful picture of us on our balcony with our, with our child. And I've never felt like more of a fraud than that day. Cause I was like, if you saw this, you would think this dude's life is like good. Like my life is not good. I mean, it's kind of good, but it's really fucked up. Like the actual truth of what we had been through as a couple and what I've been through as an entrepreneur, what my family's been through it's actually a much more interesting story, which is this severe mental illness that manifested in lots of different ways until I started to get my shit together. Yeah, and, um, and maybe take us back for a minute to the early days of Bonobos, because you've talked about that thin line between the brilliance of an entrepreneur and the potential for mania, for, for you know, where do you know when someone is the good kind of crazy or the type that we stigmatize in society. Yeah. Um, because when you started Bonobos, yeah. the idea of selling pants online was actually like pretty yeah. unheard of. Yeah. You know, it's a complicated thing, right? We, we like our entrepreneurs a little crazy. And so the unofficial title of my TED talk was how crazy is too crazy, right? Like at what, at what price innovation, at what point are we doing harm to ourselves and others by not actually like keeping our stuff in check. And so this is a little nerdy, but let's do it. There's a mood state in bipolar disorder called hypomania. And hypomania is defined by the following symptoms. Racing speech, the flight of ideas, prodigious amounts of energy, delusional self-belief, some irritability and distractibility. It's basically an entrepreneur having a good day, right? This yep. is like the hypomanic edge. And in that state, you feel creative, you feel like the world is your oyster, this is gonna work. And anyone who's built something experiences days like that, right? And during those days, you can get a lot done. And by the way, all humans have hypomanic days, ideally. Like my doctor jokes, might we all be controllably hypomanic every day? Because it's kind of like seven or eight out of 10. Yeah, I would take that for sure. We take it, right? But I would have like, 150 days like that in a row. And I was a functional alcoholic as a mood stabilizer to come down every night. And it turns out alcohol is not a recommended mood stabilizer, but if you are hypomanic, alcohol is a good way to like crash. You get shitty sleep when you drink. And so it can keep you, if you have bipolar one, from becoming manic, which is when you think you're Jesus and you end up at Bellevue, right? Which is, you can't build a company when you're manic. You can when you're hypomanic. So I think in a lot of ways, the early days of Bonobos, you know, we raised our first 8 million in capital from 140 people. I think that wouldn't have been possible in some regard. And I don't actually think it's smart to raise $8 million for a consumer products company. So we can set that aside. But there was, there was sort of a, a virtuous and an unvirtuous connection between the mood disorder and the job. Yeah, you had to be able to see the future and convince people of something that wasn't, you know, because when you started Bonobos, um, most of commerce hadn't even moved online. 
So how, how do you think about then when you started to share your story, um, how you're hoping to affect the way that other entrepreneurs, other individuals and businesses yeah. think about the topic of mental health? Yeah. So I have some like specific learnings to share with you from having disclosed such like a big secret. The first one, and I mean this in like the sweetest way, nobody cares about you. Your mom cares. Just, it's just your mom. Maybe so a few other people, but the list is short. There's like 10 people in your world who care about you. Nobody else gives a fuck about you. So this idea that you have something that is really private to you, that if you share it, will somehow change how people think about you, is not true. They don't care. And in fact, when you do share something that is unexpected, people lean in, right? Like, would this be that interesting if I was talking about selling pants? No. It's interesting because I have a severe mental illness and I'm talking about it on stage as if it's not that big of a deal. And it is a big deal, but it's not a big deal to talk about it. And if we look at neurodiversity, let's just talk about entrepreneurial populations, ADHD, addiction, substance use, autism, suicide, depression, it all over indexes. So like, y'all are fucking crazy, right? By definition, in a way, and actually being honest about whatever you're up against is a source of connection. So your, your power is in your vulnerable secrets that you hold close and just run a thought, like run the experiment of actually talking about what you would most close, hold close to the chest because I think what you'll find is it actually creates better human connections than hiding it. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, I mean, I think it's really interesting. So I was recently diagnosed with ADHD. Yes. I've thought a lot about whether to tell my team how, how that intersects with, um, you know, just my own self-perception. And it's really interesting because there are so many things in the early days of the muse, and frankly, even today, but especially in the early days, where you know, it's, it's this double-edged sword. Yeah. There were things about that ADHD that made me super effective yeah. and things that made me wildly ineffective, things that I felt like I was letting people down or I'd be criticized for by others. And it's so interesting, I think, this conversation that we're having that you're one of the leading voices in around normalizing all the different ways that our brains work yeah. uh, and, and the, the positive, the negative, the good, the bad, and the challenge of that. Yeah, totally. And I think we can have a chronic condition like the one I have, ADHD, but also I think it's important to expand the aperture that everyone has mental health, right? Like there's not a person in this room who probably by now has been spared from at least one acute mental health crisis. That could be grief, that could be physical ailment, that could be a loved one who has a mental health condition, a breakup, financial stress, a move, a new job, a shitty boss, all of these things create acute mental health crises. And so if we can expand the aperture and be like, it's actually all of us at some point who suffer from something mental health related, then it doesn't have to be like the us and them. And I certainly felt the us and them. Like I felt like I was a broken person. I felt like I was bad. I actually felt I was this thing like Andy is bipolar, which is something that we say. Would we ever say Andy is cancer? Of course not. That'd be a terrible thing to say. I mean, maybe someone would say that, that I worked with at some point. But we would never equate the identity with the illness. And for mental health, we're changing that right now, which is what makes me so optimistic. Because it's hard to be something. It's like, it's hard to be bipolar. I would rather have it, which is already really hard, than be it. And, um, and then expanding that, how has, how has your approach to leadership changed with this sort of idea and goal of normalizing the conversation around mental health? Yeah, so I think normalizing it is like not enough. Like I think normalizing it is good. It's happening. It's happening in so many different arenas. We're seeing it in sports. We've seen it a lot in entertainment. Like the conversation actually is changing. What is hard is like the money, putting the money into our mental fitness and our mental health and our mental hygiene. And right now the reimbursement is too low right? Like the reimbursement rate for mental health is paltry. Like my psychiatrist who calls himself the Michael Jordan of psychiatrists, which I think is true. He's amazing. He saved my life. Charges $1,100 for 45 minutes. 
and I have to like more or less clinically see him twice a week. So that's $120,000 a year for a psychiatrist. That's, that's unacceptable. It's, it's ridiculous. And, and insurance reimbursed 9%. So if we have something that's already kind of hard to talk about, and it's hard to find the care, and then if we finally do that hard work of acknowledging our situation, getting help, maybe getting someone in our network to help us get to the right mental health professional, and then out of pocket is cost prohibitive, that doesn't work. So what I'm seeing enterprising people do is expense your therapy through your company. I know this sounds a little wild, but it's almost like an executive coach. A leader who is in therapy is a better leader. And, and so at my new company, and we have the privilege of doing this because it's 10 people, it's not just me anymore, so we have to extend that. And so we do a stipend, it's $200 a month, for non-reimbursed mental health expenses to create that nudge of like, hey, go get whatever, whatever you're dealing with, go get a licensed clinician to help you with it. I love that. And um, it's so interesting because I've at various points in the Muse had both an exec coach and a therapist. And I think um, it's always been something that's been so important to me because if I am not investing in my own mental health, how can I show up as the right, you know, the best leader, the best colleague? Um, I was on a panel at South by Southwest where another founder tried to say that he didn't really believe in therapy. And, you know, the rest of us up there uh, sort of jumped on it and said, like, I think you're missing something really important um, because it is. It's, it's such a important investment. And I love that that's part of the culture at Pi. Yeah. No, sometimes I'll meet someone in my travels on mental health who'll say, like, well, I don't have any mental health issues, so I wouldn't know. And I'll be like, no, you have narcissistic personality disorder, which is the only mental health condition where everyone is treated except the patient. I love that. It absolutely drives me crazy when someone's like, well, I'm totally fine. I I'm have like, a clean bill of mental health. It's, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm like, oh, you're alive in 2023 and you're 100% yeah. fine? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, so... You mentioned Pi, your new company. Tell us a little bit about that because yeah. after you know building Bonovos over years and, yeah. and you know having the exit that you had, what yeah. inspired you to build again? Yeah, no, so I love consumer. I love consumer movements. After 15 years, Bonovos built it for a decade. We sold the company to Walmart. I worked at Walmart for three years. I had this dream of wanting to build a consumer company with no stores, no inventory, and no operations. The dream. I was like, I want to try this again, but without all the stuff that makes retail really hard. So we're building an app. It's called Pi. It's live in the app store. It's early days. And basically what we're trying to do is decrease friction for small groups of five to 15 people to get together in real life. And our basic theory of change is like the Surgeon General has said, social isolation is now an epidemic. Right, loneliness is now an epidemic and we need to treat it as seriously as we treated COVID. Like we need all hands on deck and people want to get together but it's just hard to establish when people are free. It's a pain in the neck to make plans. So think about Pi as like an update to like way back in the day, Evite or paperless posts or one of these things but for the social mobile era focused on small groups. Amazing and and in terms of how Pi intersects with this broader conversation yeah. about mental health, how do you think about the, the way those stories connect? Yeah, well, we can nerd out about this. So the most neglected kind of human relationship, according to the data, is platonic friendships. So like we spend all of our energy on like romance and romantic partnerships. And then we all have some understanding of like nuclear families. Platonic friendships are where we're the most happy because our platonic friendships are maximum vulnerability and maximum shared interest, but minimum obligation. Like friendship is a free market. If I don't want to be your friend anymore, I just like fade out, right? If, if you don't want to be someone's daughter anymore, you can't fade out, right? If you don't want to be someone's husband anymore, you can't just fade out, right? If you don't want to be someone's parent anymore, you can't fade out. If you don't want to work for someone anymore, you like have to do a thing. But friendship is like laissez-faire. It only exists because it should. And yet, once we get out of school and we get out of like work environments early in our career, we have no 
repeatable way to make a platonic friend. And a, an amazing woman, a friendship therapist, we need more of those, named Dr. Marissa Franco, wrote a book last year called Platonic. And she talks about the two conditions that platonic friendships emerge from, which is a hangout in a group setting of five to 10 people where it's like six or seven times that you see someone and then shared vulnerability at some point on that journey. So the nature of friendship formation is like, it can't be planned, but how do you like plan for an unplanned thing? And I, and I think we need more platonic friendship and we need to not let it decline in our lives as we get older and spouses and kids, it gets neglected. It's this thing in the corner. It's the annual trip with the whoever's no, we need platonic friendship in our day-to-day -day life because that's the person other than our therapist who we complain about everyone else to. No, it's, it's so important. And like you said, it's hard to do. I yeah. talk to so many people who come to New York, uh, friends that have moved from other places, and they're like, everyone already has their friends. Yeah. How do you break in? How do you build new relationships? And I think that point about vulnerability is so important. And it can yeah. be a hard one because if you share and it's not met, I mean, you've learned something important. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I love, I love the conversation that you're opening. I think it's such an important one. Vulnerability is so contagious. That's the cool thing about it. Like, I found I've gotten far more back than the story that I put out. Like, I've, I've heard thousands of stories at this point. This stuff is everywhere. Like, everyone is suffering. Like, the Buddha was right. Like, you all are suffering, and you're just trying to, like, get your shoes on in the morning and do life. And of course, life is beautiful too, and there's joyous moments. That's why those are so pre precious. So we have to like exchange the stories about the suffering. And you already know this probably if you're thinking about your best platonic friends are the ones who you're the most honest with. What if we could role model being proactive about disclosure in a lot of different arenas in the right way? I'm not saying like turn like your whole world into a group therapy thing, but just like strategic, selective, vulnerable disclosure, I think makes our lives so much richer. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And again, it's been interesting. I mean, when I first started The Muse, I felt like so many of the people I talked to were trying to convince me how great their companies were going. Yeah. And most early stage startups are not going great. Yeah. Um, it's just, that is sort of statistically and, and realistically um, True, because of how hard it is to build something from nothing. Yeah. And I remember first when people were presenting this fake front, how isolated and alone I felt because it can be very tempting to think I'm the only one with problems. Yeah. But exactly what you're saying is true. When I started to be honest about some of the challenges and the yeah. struggles, um, it was phenomenal to see how a lot of people opened up and shared the same things yeah. right back. Totally. No. As a founder or a, a business builder, your job is to lie in so many different arenas. You're lying to your investors, you're lying to your customers, you're lying to your suppliers. I don't mean that like in a serious way, but you're like painting this dream. The last person you have to do that with is another entrepreneur. You know what I mean? Like someone else building something says, how's it going at your company? And your answer is this, terrible, right? They're gonna laugh. The first thing they're gonna do is la gonna laugh. And now you're gonna have an honest exchange about like how terrible your lives are. And it's like, that's good, you know? So I think we have to segment projected confidence. And even, I don't know, uh, who, who here has taken outside money for their company? Like raise money. I think even with our investors, like having invested in some stuff, you actually trust entrepreneurs that tell you the truth about what's bad, but like more. Like you actually want like 60% bad news and 40% good news. When I see an entrepreneur that like writes an update, I've got one that writes the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the bad and the ugly are two thirds of the email. And I'm like, Lucy's gonna win. Because Lucy is in touch and transparent with her investors, who by the way, like that's what they need to know. And that's what creates no surprises when you're like, you know, we're in this shit show situation, you want them to be socialized the whole way on that so that it's not a surprise. Yeah, yeah. Bold and uh, hard to do, but very, very, very true. It's very hard to do because we're taught to be like stoic and to put up a front, you know, that like everything's amazing. We're taught that, but like everyone knows that's not true. Yeah. 
So if someone here is listening, and um, obviously, first of all, highly recommend that everyone watch Andy's TED Talk, pick up burn rate, it's phenomenal. If people here are thinking about their own organizations and perhaps asking, how do I, as a manager, as a leader, as a founder, create an environment that is more conducive to mental health, Yeah. what would your recommendations be? Two, two minutes a year. It only takes two minutes a year. So find one moment. It could be like a, a conversation with your executive team. It could be you're in front of a group, you're out to dinner, and tell your team something wildly unexpected that you are struggling with or have struggled with in your life. It doesn't take long. It doesn't have to be like an hour long. You don't have to do this. Um, interview me about my problems. You don't have to do that. But you will change the culture in that like one moment because it will humanize you. It'll be like, oh, this is like a real person. And this is a real person who sometimes the person building something seems like they're superhuman, right? Or maybe don't seem superhuman, but feels like there's like a block up. And it just like relaxes everyone and then hopefully they can bring their full selves, you know, to work the next day. Yeah, and, I, and actually I'd love for you to talk a, a little bit more about that because I think that what I have seen consistently is the more open and honest I'm able to be with people, the more they are able to, to not only do that in return, but then to really thrive. And so yeah. I guess, yeah, talk a little bit more about just for someone who maybe is not as comfortable uh, being open, how you foster that sort of vulnerability in, in a company, in a community. Yeah. I think it's hard to do as the first step. That's why I'm such a big believer that no matter what your situation in life is, at some point spend three to six months in therapy because it's hard. Like what I do now maybe seems like it's not like logical or something. Like it's not like, wait, what's that's weird thing that's happening. It took 600 therapy sessions just to forgive myself for having been violent when I was manic. I just, I held so much shame about that. I held so much shame about the diagnosis. It would be unnatural if you're like, well, I've got this thing that's a super traumatic part of my life. Let me just bring it up at a work dinner. You know what I mean? Like, we're, that's like down the funnel. That's like the, the add to cart after the sixth marketing impression. You know what I mean? It's like we're way down the funnel here. So you gotta start by having the conversation generally with a person who is paid to have that conversation, right? And that then enables you to have the tools to be able to talk about it. And then the surprise, the delightful surprise, which is everyone loves it. Everyone loves your suffering. They do, that's why we go to the movies, that's why we read books, that's why we listen to music. It is to benefit from the pain and suffering of artists right? And so if we can bring a little bit of that in the right doses, I think, into our professional lives, I don't know. Everyone just gets loose. And I'll, I'll mention one other thing, which is called the Being There Certificate. Lady Gaga funded this. It's a group called Jack.org. It's called Being There. And it's how do you check in with someone else who you think is having an issue? Everything is counterintuitive, right? So like, don't bring it up if you think someone is challenged by something until they do. Wrong. Wait for two weeks of observable behavior and then check in in a fact-based way and say, hey, I noticed you don't seem like your usual self. You know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna step over the line, but I just wanted to check in, like, how are you doing? And for 90% of people, that's all they need to feel seen. They may not be able to answer, but just like the check-in. Half of people who are on the journey to ending their life by suicide, who have attempted twice or more have never been asked how they're doing. And so we just gotta check in, right? We just gotta check in with people. So I recommend the being there certificate because it just helps you understand, oh, here's another one. Someone says like, hey, I'll answer the question. I've been feeling a little low. I've been a little depressed. Might be like, I suffer from depression too, right? Wrong. When someone has shared something with you, even if you're dealing with the exact same thing, you don't share then because there could be like a false equivalence. Right? Like, it's one thing to be mildly dysthymic and depressed. It's another to like, want to end your life or have explored doing so. So these are just some cool things in that training program. I think it's, yeah, I love, I love this as a resource because most people are looking to feel less alone. 
Um, and I think everything you're talking about is is around that theme of, of as you said, helping people feel seen and, and people who feel seen are, are you know, we have only a few seconds left. And so um, I guess I would just ask as we close, is there kind of one final thought or, or summary that you'd want to leave the audience with today? I mean, this one's easy for me. So when I was, when I wanted to not live anymore and I had so many days when we were building bonobos, when I was in New York, when I was unmedicated, untreated, I didn't want to live. I just didn't want to be here. And it was expected, of course, that I did, right? It was a part of the job. Like, of course you do. You do this thing or whatever. And so I was in Greenwich Village and I went into those funny, like funky, like Tibetan shops. And there was a scroll uh, that was a quote from the Dalai Lama. And it's almost like a poem or like a, it's kind of like a prayer. And it's never give up. No matter what is happening in your country, never give up. No matter what is happening in your life, never give up. No matter what is happening, you know, with your loved ones, never give up, never give up. And I hung it on my door because I just had to remind myself, never give up. Never give up. Yeah. Andy, this was incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for listening. Thank you.